And it is also good, right, and appropriate to hear from an individual who oversees and directs the development of policies and services for identity and access management to support federal government cybersecurity initiatives and enable secure online service delivery to citizens. The director of the Federal Identity Credential and Access Management Program here at GSA, Mr. Jim Shear. Yeah, thanks so much for putting this, uh, helping us put this great event together here at GSA. So we have about, what, about a, for those online, we have about 100 folks in the room. It's a full house. And uh, Liz, well, we have about 150, 200 folks on the YouTube so far. Yeah, roughly. Good. So good. Good crowd this morning here in September. And I'm really happy that a certain unruly uh, hurricane to the south did not interfere with our event. So here we are. Um, so the focus of today's uh, reverse industry training is specifically on physical access control systems. And we very much look forward to hearing from industry here uh, and from the solution provider community on the latest trends in technology and their feedback on the challenges and often the pitfalls of PACs and federal government. Um, but before we dig in, I just want to take a moment to take a step back to appreciate the hard work, all the hard work of this community and associated uh, community since HSPD-12 was, was first signed in 2004, because the vision then, and it remains today, is a common identification standard for employees and contractors government-wide. So, and maybe, well actually maybe many of you recall those early tough battles when we were getting agencies, for example, to perform even basic background investigation checks on all their employees. Like those were, a lot of work went into making sure that was happening properly. Yeah, you know, then there were the long, there was all the work around technology standardization at NIST and elsewhere to make sure that the technologies we're selecting are secure, they're best in breed, and that they're interoperable across government. And NIST taking the lead there in FIPS 201 and other associated standards. Um, next came the challenge, of course, of making sure that employees had these credentials. So we, we know who they are, how do we issue these things? And uh, that was a years long effort. A lot, and a lot of great people involved in standing up those systems and making sure we were all um, we all had the PIV process in place at our agencies. Um, then in 2015, a little certain something happened. There was a large HR-related database, unfortunately, that had a little bit of a breach. Um, it had been hacked. And so cybersecurity leaders stepped in and really started focusing in on making sure that this strong identity PIV process that we had uh, could be leveraged to better secure our, uh, our networks. Um, especially for privileged users, so for our super users like system administrators. And, and since then, agencies have made tremendous strides in progress, so a lot of work going into leveraging the technology. Um, and also kind of ferreting out, kind of looking at communities uh, uh, that need sort of populations for whom maybe the PIV card or the factor might, might be the best fit. We also struggle about mobile. And so there's a lot of innovation going on right now, notably at NIST and New Special Publications, 863, and at OMB in the policy space to innovate policy to make sure we can leverage the best technologies going forward while meeting that original um, vision. So. Um, no, and in, but in our program and in the CIO Council, so I'm also chair of the Identity Credential and Access Management Subcommittee of the CIO Council and of the CISO Council, you know, agencies are frequently bringing to us, so where is the sense of urgency and priority in physical access? So we've made all this progress. Can we leverage all this tremendous work that's been done over, since two, 2004 to bring to bear in our physical access systems? So, so not just in networks, but also in buildings across government. And by the way, we have great examples of this already going on. So I don't know if you know, but we reopened a tunnel recently over to the Department of the Interior here, and I can just walk into that building, use my card. Great example of, of one uh, being able to access the other. And by the way, just approach me if you'd like to see our, one of DC's secret tunnels. It's, it's kind of neat. We can talk about it later. Um, but a scan of the last 12 months um, of news headlines and, and reports shows a trend, and that is as logical access has gotten a lot better, um, physical breaches to get physical access to these servers has increased. It's a problem. Physical access is sometimes and very often kind of that weakest link in gaining access to our systems and to IC, IT systems including. So very little of even our best cyber defenses matter when an attacker can get physical access and proximities to these systems. Um, and unfortunately, uh, there are many instances where physical access control is based on single factor uh, proximity card technology. And if we put that in terms of logical access, it's kind of similar to using um, passwords that we can't change to access the systems. And so we want to do a better job of securing um, the front door. 
Um, and much work remains to address this potential vulnerability in physical access. But you know, the PAX world, as we've seen over the last 10 years, is very large and diverse. And many of you are here today, I think. So we have the chief security officers. These are the folks who actually stand guard at our doors and protect our buildings and run these systems. You have the CIOs, including the information security folks who care a lot about protecting our IT assets with strong authentication, including these PAC systems. And then, of course, you have the large community of acquisition folks who are making sure we buy the right solutions in a, in a competitive marketplace. And the White House, of course, leads in policy and setting standards. Here at GSA, we have multiple programs, but notably, we have our GSA FICAM program, which has been active in this space since HSPD-12 was signed. And it includes the FIPS, the program that you're all very familiar with, the FIPS 201 evaluation program and our approved products list. So, and the background there, again, for many, maybe the uh, folks in the room who are, who have the same 10-year history, um, it was first stood up in 2005, so OMB had instructed GSA through policy to establish a shared service for federal agencies to test and approve uh, products relevant to HSPD-12 and to list them on this approved products list. The program develops test requirements from NIST standards and incorporates known risks and threats in the operational environment to test the security and interoperability of commercial products with our PIV infrastructure. So based on feedback from industry and agencies, around 2012, the program revamped the testing of PACs by introducing end-to-end -to -end system testing. And it's a great benefit because it allows you to know exactly which products work together. So this is very helpful for our implementers and our acquisition folks. And I think I just advanced our slide, so we'll get the next one. Um, so as part of this effort, a dedicated lab was established to perform this testing, free of charge to the vendors and agencies, to provide a, the testing itself, to provide a knowledge base and facility for agencies wanting to learn more about the existing approved PAX pro products or be able to troubleshoot with FICAM PAX experts on our team and of course on, on our larger team in the lab. And once these products and services have been tested, they get listed on the approved products list, which is on idmanagement.gov for reference. So we're continuously iterating on our requirements to adjust to new threats and feedback from industry and agencies. And just recently we've made substantial updates to the APL. And we also support the federal acquisition community, including our colleagues in GSA here in the Federal Acquisition Service, or FAS. For example, draft recommended procurement language is found on idmanagement.gov, and we hope this language is helpful, maybe a simple copy and paste in helping to guide acquisitions. So what's coming soon? So we have new identity policy in the works that refreshes many of the concepts and work, including the uh, FIPS 201 test program and APL, that's at the White House right now uh, in, in draft. Uh, we want to make sure that the CSOs, uh, chief security officers, and the chief information officers work together. So there's so much uh, intersection there that that collaboration in an agency is critical to ensure that the IT used in PACs meets all of our requirements and security. We're going to continue to update our FICAM roadmap um, and our architecture. We're, we're working on a PACs playbook with industry to better explain PACs and how it works. And we want to make it easier for agencies to buy products. So in closing, I really want to encourage everybody to remain, we already have a lot of, but remain actively involved with our program since we have all these great touch points in helping to guide procurement standards policy across government. And so we welcome your um, input. For the feds in the room, we have the great ICAM subcommittee, and you, which I co-chair with Colonel Tom Clancy of uh, the Department of Defense. And we have our evaluation program technical working group. So and we want to hear your thoughts on how to improve everything I just mentioned, the test program, our guidance, architecture, et cetera. So, so that's kind of my piece of it here at GSA, and so now I'm thrilled for our next speaker who can give us kind of the big picture at GSA and where we're going and some of our major reform initiatives. So with that, I'll thank you all for coming, and I look forward to meeting all of you in person over the course of the day. And now I think let's welcome the person setting policy to direction as the Associate Administrator of GSA's Office of Government-Wide Policy and as the Chief Acquisition Officer, Jessica Salmaragi. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the first government-wide reverse industry training event on PACs. I'm Jessica Salmaragi, and I'm the Associate Administrator for the Office of Government-Wide Policy, and I also serve as the Chief Acquisition Officer here at GSA. It is a pleasure to address you today. GSA is committed to engaging all stakeholders, and particularly our industry partners, 
to drive improvements in policy that help the government acquire needed products and services in a more efficient and effective manner. Today's events will be in a testament that GSA is listening to our industry partners. The information gained here will play a critical role in advancing government-wide cybersecurity and physical security policies and initiatives. GSA has a long history of helping agencies acquire physical access products and services. We do this in three ways. First, perhaps the most familiar is the GSA Federal Supply Schedule Program, and specifically Schedule 70 and 84. Agencies use those schedules to acquire PACS products and services. Many of your PACS solutions can be found on one or both of these schedules. Second, OGP has a seat on the FAR Council. The FAR contains a principal set of rules governing federal procurement, including those on physical access control systems. Acquisition officials across government follow those FAR rules, and it also governs the schedules to some extent here at GSA. Last but not least is the Federal Identity Credential and Access Management, or FICAM division, also in OGP. FICAM coordinates the implementation of personal identity verification for physical access to government buildings and systems. The office runs the FICAM test program and maintains the approved products list, which enumerates many of the products necessary for PACS regulations. Collaboration across these areas helped to provide for a single, interoperable credential to access networks and buildings across the government. The FAR sets the rules that agencies must use the approved products list. FICAM distributes guidance while maintaining the APL, and the GSA schedules then make those products available to agencies government-wide. It is Administrator Murphy's goal to make GSA a best-in-class provider, and the conversation today will help meet that objective. Physical security is critical to the health of both the federal government and to industries. In recent years, the government has made tremendous progress in enabling PIV to help secure those networks. The federal government continues to reduce the risk of another OPM-level incident by enforcing the use of strong PIV credentials for login, especially for users like system administrators who have the keys to the kingdom. Moreover, the president's management agenda, released earlier this year, reaffirms that cybersecurity is a cross-agency priority goal. While we're improving in cybersecurity, using PIV credentials for building security government-wide remains a work in progress. Agency implementation varies, often constrained by competing budget priorities, workforce challenges, or purchasing the right products and services. Collaboration with stakeholders is critical to the success of GSA. One of the several th ways that we collaborate with industry is through these reverse industry training days. This model offers a platform for industry to share their challenges in doing business with the federal government, while also providing insights and best practices in the marketplace. Frankly, these trainings help us find solutions to the challenges that the federal government's facing. Today marks GSA's fifth training. Previous trainings have included discussions on cloud computing, the federal supply schedule, and leasing. For each training, industry effort and engagement was impressive. I'd like to thank the Secure Technology Alliance and the Security Industry Association for their hard work in planning and executing today's event. Thank you. The focus of our RIT today is to empower agencies to improve their acquisition, planning, implementation, and testing processes for PACs through market engagement. We are acutely aware that the federal government is not the only customer in the access control market. And we are particularly interested in what has worked well in other markets, again, to better serve all of our stakeholders. At GSA, our goal is to give agencies competitive, easy to use, fully FAR compliant solutions for our government-wide acquisition vehicles. As Chief Acquisition Officer, I want to ensure that GSA is providing its agency customers with best-in-class solutions. Our plan is to take the valuable feedback provided today by industry and along with feedback from our agency customers to help inform ongoing business improvement efforts at GSA. We hope this event will demonstrate the impact that industry has on driving change and improvements to our programs and processes, which will result in better outcomes for our customers. On behalf of Administrator Murphy, I extend a heartfelt thanks for your participation in our first PACS event.
We truly hope that you will walk away with better insights into the importance of the implementation, the intricacies of acquiring the proper PAC systems, challenges faced by agencies, PACs resources, and above all, GSA's commitment to viable solutions to improve the overall PACs processes for all stakeholders. Thank you for attending. Outstanding. Now, to further set the stage for our exploration of the acquisition life cycle for physical access control systems, please welcome Lars Sundeborn of the Secure Technology Alliance and, I believe, a distant Scandinavian relative of the most interesting man in the world. Please, Lars. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That's going to be a hard one to live up to. <laughs> Anyway, uh, first of all, it has truly been an honor to have been participating and help putting this program together with both our own membership and the membership of the, secure, uh, the Security Industry Association. First, Secure Technology Alliance. We are a nonprofit, multi-industry advisory group, and uh, we have been engaged with the PICAM program, PIV program, since the, uh, since the very, very beginning. And today, we have corroborated with the other industry associations, the, um, the SIA, Security Industry Association, and Jake Parker, thank you. We have pulled in expertise from the memberships of both groups to put this together. And the purpose for this is to provide what we think is appropriate level, a high level, of how the different stakeholders work together. We have NIST, who established a standard for what the access control system should do. We have manufacturers who build equipment that are claimed to comply with these standards. We have GSA and the evaluation program who tests and let these systems prove that they indeed do process all the complexity uh, cryptographic algorithms and processes that are required to do path discovery and path validation today. Then we have certified people that have proven and demonstrated some knowledge that they understand what these systems need to be do, need to do and be configured in the field. We have then the uh, interagency security specialist that works in, in conjunction with the agency security specialist, the CIO and CSO, to formulate what is required, what is the proper security level for each one of the different areas. We have the procurement that, uh, that takes that input and put it into some type of language that the industry can reply, reply to. And we're going to see here today some of the tools that exist within idmanagement.gov and uh, gsa.gov. And uh, we have the manufacturers, sales partners, the VAR, the value-added resellers, that are often the front line to make these things work, implement them in the field, and do the life cycle management. And we have project management and life cycle management for that. And with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you so much. And the next speaker here is going to be... Me yep. again. Yep. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> And we are off. I believe we would all acknowledge that the bulk of innovation in the United States comes from industry, whatever it is. Security, technology, construction, products or services, the greatest creative answers come from the private sector. And we in the federal government, though, need that kind of creativity. So let's listen uh, to our guests and the advice that they have for us on physical access control systems for us in the federal government. And I say listen, but we also want you to interact. Now in this room, we are going to have microphones strategically located, but for those of you, uh, even in this room, or for those of you watching on the GSA YouTube channel, use your information communication technology devices and email us. If there's anything that you see, you hear, that you find interesting, you've got a question about or a comment about, email it to reverseindustrytraining at gsa.gov. We will pass those questions on to our moderators who will then weave the questions into their conversation. Those questions not answered will be compiled in a question and answer document that we'll post along with the recordings of these proceedings. Now, with that, finally, getting to some content, let's explore the basic project planning steps, stakeholder roles, and considerations for determining the physical access control system that is just right for your agency in our session, basic planning prior to a PAX procurement. And let's heed our speaker's guidance to make sure we don't end up with a low cost system that does not reduce risk or nor end up with an expensive system where the costs just aren't, just aren't justified. So please, to lead our panel, welcome Mike Kelly of Parsons. Oops. There we go, sir. 
Good morning. Thank you. A um, little by way of background, I've been doing this for uh, systems integration, but better part of 35 years, 17 of which has been specifically towards electronic security, physical access control, and smart cards. So I've been doing this quite a while. Um, learned quite a bit along the way. And one of the things I want to focus on today, everybody starts with the procurement, but what do you do in preparation before you actually get to that point? And there's a lot of steps that are specific to a packed system that we want to talk about. So the first thing you need to understand is what is actually, what are we actually accomplishing with physical access control? And there's four components to any physical access control transaction. You'll see them on the bottom right. Uh, we're going to assert an identity, all right? Individuals are no longer making the decisions about who you are. You're telling a machine this. So you have that mechanism that says, I'm trying to tell you this is who I claim to be. Then the computer, the system, is going to authenticate that identity and say, yes, I believe him, no, I don't believe him. Assuming that you're authenticated, your identity is authenticated, you're going to go ahead and get that authorization to say, now that I know who you are, do you actually have permission? Is this the right door, the right time, right place? Can I get into this, uh, you know, into this particular space I'm trying to access? And then finally is auditing. Once you get through that, going back and looking, did the people get access when they needed it? Were people rejected when they needed to be rejected? And make sure that nobody was falsely accepted or rejected either way. That's all well and good. So when we look at HSPD-12, what does HSPD-12 focus on? And everybody you've seen, I'm sure you've all seen the presentations, there's, there's four criteria in HSPD-12 with the credential and how you go about getting the credential. But right after that is the statement that I have up on screen here. And that is that you have to have a graduated criteria. You're trying to manage the risk, but, not, but risk isn't the same for every space. If I get into a janitor closet, inadvertently, you know, without authorization, the risk is pretty low. If I get into a data center, obviously risk is very high. So we need that criteria. We need to make sure we're not putting things in the wrong places and, um, and making sure we manage that risk appropriately. We don't want to build a Fort Knox where operations are negatively impacted. And we also don't want to make it to where everybody can get into anything. So that's, that's what I mean when I, when I want to focus today on this last statement. So what are some of the challenges that we have in these, uh, in these types of projects? Some of these you're going to recognize, and they're common to any procurement, any project. Some of them are very unique to PACs. And the first thing you have to understand is your organization and the mission. And the organization is, is fairly straightforward. You know, you have GSA here in this building. But think about it a little further. How many different functions within this building go on on a day-to-day -day basis in different parts of the building, in different spaces within the building. What happens if you have a building where you have multiple organizations which may or may not have the same, um, the same goals, the same objectives? So you need to recognize some of those things. Um, budget and time constraints. Any task along these lines, any system design, there's always trade-offs that have to be made. There's time constraints, there's budget constraints, and recognizing those up front, recognizing how much you can do in the time you have and the budget that you have to work with, you know, that, that's uh, um, something you need to recognize up front because if you over-promise and under-deliver, your projects are doomed to fail. And that's something you have to recognize up front, and they may change throughout the life of your, prog uh, your program. The third thing you have to recognize is the existing conditions. And by that I mean not only the systems that you're working with, because very seldom do you get a chance to come in and say, there's no system, I'm starting from scratch, and I get a completely clean slate. And the challenge is not so much to get the readers, the panels, and all the equipment up on the wall, but how do you make that transition from whatever is there at the beginning, how do you make that transition back to something uh, to something that is newer, that's compliant, that still manages your risk, but with doing that without impacting your operations. Okay? So every one of those, if anybody tells you that there's, uh, that there's two projects that are the same, I, I would challenge them on it because I've been doing this for a long time and I've never seen two projects that are identical. That are identical. 
there's always some differences and you need to strive early on in the process to identify what those differences are. The other big challenge you have is moving targets. Things are continually changing. Look at the standards from HSP to 12 and all the supporting documentation. Is there any one of those single documents that's on version one at this point in the game? No, they've gone through a series of changes, policies have changed, these documents have changed over time. Again, with your organization and your mission, these projects are not gonna happen overnight. There's gonna be a period of time to make these implementations happen depending on how large the scope of your project. And I can guarantee you that at some point in that project, something will change. Either a mission will change, an organization, some kind of restructuring in an organization or a portion of the organization. And then finally, the threats and the vulnerabilities. Those are constantly changing. And in any risk management program, you're going to always be looking and going through a cycle. It's not a linear process where you start, get to the end, and you never do it again. It's a cycle. And you're going to have to be continually evaluating the risks to your agencies, to your facilities, and to your missions. So those things are always moving, and you need to have some amount of flexibility. You don't want to paint yourself in a corner in your projects so that you can actually address these as they come up. And then the final challenge is the tendency to, to uh, achieve compliance all at once. You're not going to get there. This is going to be a process. You have to take your time doing it. Don't, um, don't try to take the whole piece all, all in one shot. You want to sit there and break this into small, measurable steps. Not only because it's easier to manage your budget, your time, your risk as you go through this project, but also because it's easier to show progress. If I have this roadmap well-defined and I'm hitting my interim objectives as I go through this process, uh, it's much easier to maintain the support of your stakeholders, of your executive sponsor, your customers, your tenants, and all, the, and all those people. If I structure a program in such a way or procurement in such a way that I only have one objective, it's at the end, and it's a two-year program, people are going to be going through and saying, well, what's happening? How close are you? Are you making progress? Are you on track? Are you, off? you need to break this down into smaller manageable steps. And the other benefit of breaking that down into smaller manageable steps is it gives you opportunities to adjust to those changes that we talked about just a few minutes ago in the earlier slide. Next important piece, assembling your project team. And most of the time when people think about the PACs and the project team, they focus on the two in red there, the physical security specialist. And, and if you're lucky, you've got somebody thinking not only about physical security, but about the information, uh, uh, information technology. PAC systems today are information systems. There's no ifs, ands, or doubts about it. There's no question about it. And it has to be managed as such. Okay? But there's a whole lot of other people that have to be involved at various points in this process. Um, and they fall into a couple of different categories. Over on the left, I have the other government agencies. And that's where this process starts with the standards from NIST, from GSA, from Department of Homeland Security in terms of the ISC standards. Um, that's, that's the target, and that's compliance. Compliance is great. It's absolutely essential to obtain compliance or to achieve compliance. But com there's ways to achieve compliance without managing risk or without uh, reducing the risk properly. So if you don't do that, you need to be aware of the standards. List of, group, uh, list of uh, resources and, and people that you need to identify within, most often within your agency. And the first and most important one is that executive sponsor. If you don't have executive sponsor uh, support for your program, for your project, it's simply not going to happen. Um, if you look at this list of people here, they're going to be interacting with different groups, different organizations, different agencies, and people representing different groups on a daily basis. And it's not, you're not always going to have the same common goals. You're going to have concerns that you want to address one way. Somebody else in an or, another organization is going to have different goals, different concerns, different objectives. And you need that executive sponsor to help uh, support you and smooth that path out. Um, customers themselves, everybody that comes through this door, everybody that comes through the lobby, they're your customers when you're doing a physical access control system. Uh, nothing worse than coming in and having a line back out the door because somebody can't authenticate. Uh, it just takes all the credibility of the, of the system and of the program away if you don't address that. 
uh, budget. We talked a little bit about that already in the acquisition process. They have to work hand in hand. How many people think of legal, uh, some legal represent, uh, representation when you do a PAC system? Um, you know, we do have a certain amount of uh, personally identifiable information in these systems, um, both from the vetting and the credential side, but, only, but also on the PAC side. How long do you retain the data? What's your privacy and retention policies? Who can access that data when? Uh, so you need those people involved. Uh, personnel, as far as getting people into... Um, uh, knowing that they have a, a need to be into your facilities and you need to coordinate those policies with the uh, personnel people in your organization. And safety, because access control impacts how you access the passive ingress and egress into your building, so you need to have some safety representatives. There's a couple of functions that may be entirely agency, within the agency, maybe totally within uh, industry or maybe some combination of them. Uh, most often those are physical security, information technology, uh, and some of your facility management and engineering people. And then finally, things that you, uh, resource that you'll find exclusively from the industry side. You will find consultants that um, will, will come in and independently assess from either a system standpoint or a physical security standpoint. They can augment your staff. Uh, equipment manufacturers, uh, value-added resellers, which is a term many of you may not be familiar with, but it, within the industry, the value-added resellers act as the manufacturer's representatives. They don't actually manufacture the equipment, but they're responsible to come out, design, install, and configure your systems. And they have that partnership with the manufacturer. They're your single point of contact back to an equipment manufacturer. And the integrators, uh, which is also uh, typically the integrators are value-added resellers. Uh, the only exception to that would be if you're uh, potentially integrating to other systems for other sources of data. So the biggest takeaway from this slide, identify the resources that you need. Identify where they're coming from. Are they coming from within your organization? Are they coming from outside your organization? Is it a mixture? And most importantly, when you have contractors support or augmenting any one of these resources, Make sure that you define how those contractors will interact because there's nothing worse than having two contractors and, and it'll derail a project quickly to butt heads because they both have different contractual terms, different obligations, and that's something that needs to really be worked into your project plan. Hey, Mike. Yes. Can I ask a question? Yeah, well, Steve, why don't we get to, let me get to the end because we do have a few minutes set aside for questions unless... Uh, and that was on your previous slide. Mm -hmm. I think I understand the NIST and GSA influences. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I understand the DHS one. Can you elaborate briefly? Sure. So DHS right now is chairing the Interagency Security Committee. And, and when we get into the risk, and, and you'll see that clearly as we go through when I, do, when I start talking about the risk assessments, that that's where that's going to factor in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So... Most people, when you, when you start thinking about any kind of a procurement, you jump right into your developing your scope for your procurement. And you develop your costs, you develop your timelines, start identifying potential solutions if you're doing equipment or systems and potential providers. And same thing with, with procurement strategy. Uh, you know, you're, who's going to be responsible for what, roles, responsibilities, the standards that you need to follow, achieve, uh, what types of procurement vehicles may or may not be available. Uh, and, and all those kinds of things. These are all pretty standard in, in across almost any procurement. Uh, you get into deployment. The deployment is a little bit different uh, with the PAC system, specifically on uh, installation design, your configuration, your cutover. Uh, those things are, are tend to be more system-specific. But where everybody misses is the two on the left. Because if you notice, that scope development, the first task I have under there is the risk to be mitigated. Well, how do you define that? You need a mechanism, you need a process to be able to go back and define what it is. Because again, I can achieve compliance, but achieving compliance may not do me any good if I'm not reducing the risk to an acceptable level. And that's really the ultimate goal. Compliance will come with it as you go through this process, but you need to define the risks that you're trying to mitigate and know that what you're doing from a physical access control uh, perspective will actually mitigate those risks. Okay. 
and we'll talk about the, the characterization and the risk uh, throughout the rest of this uh, presentation. One of the things you need to be very cognizant of is your legal and regulatory requirements. When you're doing your, when you're defining your project, when you're uh, creating your project characterization, uh, first and foremost, federal laws. And again, it's not only, uh, it's, it's not only the PAC system itself, but think about all the data that's in the PAC system, where that data comes from, where it's going to. You have privacy laws, you have different laws governing how you interact with that data. At the state and local level, you will almost undoubtedly, depending on the facility, find that you're going to have different uh, jurisdictions that have some level of control, especially in a, in a leased uh, facility, uh, what they typically call authority having jurisdiction for life safety issues, uh, low voltage electrical codes, licensing and permit requirements, and those are going to vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, if you go to a place like where I'm, I'm from, New Jersey, um, every township has a separate separate organization, and I would have to actually go through and permit every place that I touched. Um, so that, that's something you have to be very cognizant of and make sure that the um, vendors that you're asking to propose are well aware and licensed in the places that they need to be licensed in and they're uh, familiar with those local requirements so you don't get yourself into any trouble. And they're going to vary in applicability. Uh, agency regulations you're going to have not only your agency, but depending on the facility that you have, uh, it's not uncommon to have multiple uh, organizations within a single facility. You may have competing uh, agency regulations, uh, even in, within department to department. One department wants to do something one way, one wants to do is, uh, something another way. And you need to know what those regulations and those requirements are so that you can address them up front, address any conflicts, uh, and make sure those get resolved. And then requirements from other agencies. You know, we already talked a little bit about uh, some of the standards from NIST and uh, DHS and things along those lines. So there, at time to time, there are other agencies that imply or infer requirements on you, and you need to have understanding that. And probably one of the most valuable things is a tool, and it's not a, re a regulatory requirement, but there are industry uh, best practices and guidelines, and they come from the manufacturers themselves in terms of the systems and how they would like to see them installed, configured, and things that, yes, you can do it, but it's not going to work that way. It's not going to be best supported that way. Um, and then you have industry organizations like the Secure Tech Alliance, Security Industry Association, and ASIS International. They all have different standards and different best practices and guidelines that you can leverage as far as defining your program. When I get into project characteris uh, characteristics, uh, first and foremost, I'm going to define the type and size of the facility I have. And I need to know what my boundaries are, where it is that I'm trying to, where are the assets that I'm trying to protect. Am I responsible for just a single suite in a multi-use, multi-tenant facility? Am I responsible for an entire building? Maybe it's even an entire campus. But I need to have that scope defined up front. I need to know where the boundaries are. Do I have people with inside my perimeter that have maybe a separate perimeter? Uh, you'll see a little bit later on this afternoon when we talk about one of the programs that uh, uh, Roger Rohr and I worked on uh, where we give you some examples of that. When I know my facility and know what it is or where it is that I'm trying to protect, again, whether it's just a room or a building or a space, the next thing I want to look at is the what is that, what functions happen in that place, in that facility? What's been done in that room? What's done in that building? What happens if I, that, that function goes away, if I'm unable to function? And that's the whole, uh, the whole goal, right? I'm trying to reduce the risk so that my operation can continue is often, you know, in as unobtrusive a way as possible. I want to be successful in my organization and how I run. Um, but to do that, I need certain types of assets. So I have assets, people, equipment, materials, information, whether it's, you know, uh, whether it's uh, personnel information, medical information, contract, financial. Uh, I need to know where and how these assets are in the facility. You know, where are they stored? How are they stored? What format are they in? Um, where 
if I know where these people are, I know what I'm trying to protect. If I know where these assets are, I should say, I know what it is I'm trying to protect, and I know how I'm going about doing that. Um, and then I also need to know how critical each of these assets are to my organization, because again, my my sole goal is to make sure the mission continues. There's some assets that, okay, I have backups, I have spares, I have I can have, tap other resources where that's not an issue. There are some that if I lose access to an asset, that's it. My organization can no longer complete its mission, its objective, and that's a much more critical asset. Once I've determined where those assets are and how critical are, they are, I'm going to look at how I'm protecting them now, right? There may be places where I just don't want to focus on right now because, look, they're protected sufficiently. I don't need to do anything, or if I do need to do something, it's a lower priority. And when you get into budget and time constraints uh, and you're trying to make those trade-off decisions, that's where this comes into the equation, right? I have some things that, yeah, they may not be perfect, but I have bigger risks in other areas that I need to take the money, the resources, the time that I have, and I need to address them there first. So knowing how I'm currently, currently protecting my assets and how effective they are uh, is part of this process when I'm characterizing uh, my program. When I go to do the risk assessment itself, and ideally, because I remember I said risk is a process, it's not a linear, uh, just a linear one-time activity. Um, I'm Ideally, I'm already starting off with an existing risk assessment that's been done on the facility and within the, in the spaces within that facility. So ideally, I'm just looking to look at the assumptions that were made in that, in that risk assessment, making sure everything is still valid, and that can be a fairly quick process. If you don't have an existing risk assessment and you're starting from scratch, that's going to take a significant amount more, a uh, significantly larger effort to do that. A couple of pieces of guidance that I can look at to help me with that process. And the first is uh, NIST Special Publication 800-116. There's some very good guidance in there about establishing risks for spaces, for individual spaces within a facility, so that I know how to select what uh, level of security I need to put on a given door in the facility. Uh, I mentioned the Interagency Security Committee earlier on. Interagency Com Security Committee has standards for establishing the facility uh, security level. And it's a one to five scale. The only problem that I have with what that by itself is that it only gets you to the facility perimeter. And for you to make access control decisions at individual doors within your facility, you need to go a, a level further down. You know, you need to be looking at individual doors, individual spaces in your facility. And then finally, ASIS International, which also provides some, um, some guidance on performing risk assessments. I said earlier that we are looking at the assets and the threats and the um, so I'm going to look at all those assets that I had, and I'm going to try to, to understand based on uh, common patterns. I'm going to look at the threats and what types of threats face those assets. A um, couple different tools I can use for that. I can go back and look at similar facilities. I can go back and look at similar organizations, even if they're in different types of facilities, geographic common patterns, and try to just get an understanding from a, in a relative manner um, what the level of risk is to each one of those critical assets and how they might actually be uh, attacked. So from the uh, understanding the adversary motivation and capabilities. And then I'm going to look for the weak points. And uh, somebody once said to me, to, to be in this business, you need to think like a bad guy, right? So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to come in there. I'm going to start from my perimeter. I'm going to look and work my way inward, look to those assets. How would I get to those critical assets? you know, and try to identify the vulnerabilities and how they would be attacked. And at the end of the day, when you define risk, it really is a probability of how likely is a negative event going to happen, and if it does happen, how big an impact is it going to have? And when I say impact, I mean impact on your organization's ability to complete its, uh, its mission and its objectives. When you get down to the, the uh, probability and consequence, it's simple. Uh, you can actually plot it on a 1 to 10 scale and just looking at the relative risks, the relative um, probability, and the relative consequence, the impact to your organization. And when I get into making those trade-offs between time and budget and, and defining how much scope I'm going to put into each, each phase of my project, I want to be focusing in the areas in red first. 
those high probability, they're most likely to happen. And if they do happen, they're also going to have a very large impact on my mission. Right? And as I have more resources, as those high, high probability, high consequence um, uh, things are addressed, then I can work my way down as more resources get available uh, to where I'm addressing the uh, lower probability, lower consequence. Okay. And when you look at the risk, one of the things you have to understand is you're never going to eliminate the risk. Risk is always there. It's something you cannot eliminate. But what you can do is you can reduce that level of risk. Um, and you can do it on one of two things. I, I said it was the probability and the, and the uh, consequence. I can reduce either one of those. Uh, reducing the consequence is really not anything that, that PAX does for us, right? Uh, but there are some, some techniques I can employ through redundancy, insurance, things along those lines. Where PAX comes in is I'm reducing the probability. So by restricting access to sensitive assets, materials, and requiring higher levels, I, I went through the access control um, transaction where I'm doing authentication earlier on. By taking some additional steps to, make, to raise my level of assurance that I know who's asking for access to those assets, and then selecting the appropriate authentication mechanisms. And again, it's a, it's a balancing act. So uh, on the one hand, I can reduce consequence and probability. I can reduce it significantly. But at what cost? There's always going to be a cost in terms of dollars, in, time, in terms of time, effort, and in, on impact in operations. Okay. So when I get right down to defining my system, and all these decisions, they go into the number of types of readers that I need in my system. Where are they? Uh, how many readers? What types of readers? How many panels? All these readers, every reader you see at a door ties back to a panel somewhere. And the more readers I have, the more panels I have. And then going back even further in the system from that, all the supporting infrastructure, the power and the network and all the communication uh, that's an, that increases exponentially as your system grows. Uh, along with the software licenses, uh, my initial, not only my, my initial uh, purchase, but my ongoing software, manual software maintenance costs. When I talk about an authentication factor, and that's a term you may or may not be familiar with, but when you boil it right down, it's, it's three things. It's either something you have, something you know, or something you are. And there's ways to do that with the, with the PIV cards at the door. The trade-off, again, is how long does that transaction take? How expensive is it if I have higher, uh, more authentication factors? I'm checking more things at the door. Those readers are going to be more expensive. Okay. If the PAC system as a whole is too large, my costs go up. And I may, you know, if I'm spending a lot of money to reduce a very small amount of risk, those things that were down in that lower left blue uh, quadrant, then I probably haven't hit the mark. I'm trying to strike that balance. If my PAX is too small, um, then I may not be addressing all those risks that are up in the red. I may be spending, some, you know, I may save a lot of money and may, may not even put a lot of resources to it, but at the end of the day, my risk uh, is still too high for the facility, for the assets, and I, have, I may not be able to carry out my mission. Okay? If you leave here with two thoughts... And these are the biggest two that, that I would like you all to leave here with. And that's the first is to make sure you identify all your stakeholders up front, early on the process. And that whole list that I had earlier on where I had, you know, things about the budget and your customers and your executive sponsor, that's essential here. And keeping that team, knowing how that team is assembled, who's at, what their roles and responsibilities are, and more importantly, how their governance, how you... Um, how those team, or how those individual team members interact, right? How they communicate and what the, the rules of engagement are across the team. And then the other one is that make sure you go through and do a true evaluation of your project, your characteristics, so that you understand the risks of facilities and what you're truly trying to achieve to make sure you strike that balance between the time and budget and the effort that you're putting into it. Okay. So with that, uh, I think we have a few minutes. I'll open it up for any questions.
Okay. Excuse me. You said earlier that you would work with uh, the uh, both the IC and then uh, we heard you talk about the agency security specialist. What time in the process, at what stage in the process would you engage these different stakeholders on, on both the IT security side and fiscal security side? Um, for both of those, I would I would um, bring those uh, those individuals in as early as possible. Um, first of all, if I don't have my physical security specialist um, already engaged in the process, I have no basis to know what type of risks that I'm trying to mitigate. And if I can't define that, I cannot build my system. I can't build the specs for my system. Um, from the inner, uh, from the IT security side, these are information security or these are information technology systems, IT systems, and you know the in the old days these PAC systems used to be completely standalone systems. Nobody was even aware that they were out there. They had their own separate private closed networks. Well, that's not the case anymore. Some of these authentication mechanisms that I talked about actually require internet connectivity, and you need to coordinate that. The other thing is that to get your certification and accreditation for these systems, to get these systems online, knowing the requirements um, and working with your IT specialists and your information security specialists to make sure that you address that early on. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, Mike, you mentioned the DHS ISC guidance, mm -hmm. some of their, their work, which is excellent. So a absolutely. Any, absolutely. any recommendations there on, on guidance or that they can issue or work on that maybe even reflects this entire process you've mentioned today? Like, uh, what, what, are your, what are your recommendations on gaps or opportunities there? The, the biggest gap with the ISC, it's not, and it's not even so much of a gap. What they've done is, is fantastic work uh, in terms of establishing the, the facility level. But it stops at the perimeter. And when you're looking at from a physical access control point standpoint, you have to actually look inside the facility and you have to take that same process and actually expand it and bring it inside the facility and have a mechanism, a methodology that you can use to go in and, and assess the different spaces in your facility, where the assets are in those facilities, and have some way of uh, some process, a common process to do that. And I think if you do that, then you can tie it to the authentication mechanisms and get more consistency across the facilities. Mike, since you mentioned that a lot of the systems that are in place today are completely standalone closed loop systems, not part of the IT network, right. can you um, articulate again what are the fundamental changes about the ICAM packs uh, but makes that different than what maybe the legacy system was in that facility that you're going in to try to replace or upgrade? Sure. So when we talked about the different authentication mechanisms, um, in the past, something you have, something you know, um, it was basically limited to, you know, you, you, put it, you present your card. I don't need to talk to anybody else outside my facility for that. And you enter your PIN. I don't need to talk to anybody for that. And even if I did something about, uh, you know, uh, something you are, a biometric, even that was stuck inside the closed system. There was none of this, there was no information sharing. So we look at our authentication mechanism, and now we're doing certificate-based validation. We have to get back to the certificate authorities, um, you know, for PKI. And that's really where the, uh, to support those authentication mechanisms, that's where you need that external facing connection for these systems. And those in the past didn't exist. Uh, you're seeing them more now, but, you know, 10 years ago you didn't see them. Yes, Steve. So, so Mike, when I was, I had a whole hell of a lot of fun doing what I would call site surveys mm -hmm. and analysis of sites. Correct. And, uh, contributed to some design work on sites. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I learned was there's an amazing amount of stuff where you really need to ask the question, what's behind that door? Because that's how you learn what you're protecting. And so the other thing I learned is the amazing amount of stuff of integration of video with, you know, door prop, door open, and tailgating and all that sort of fun stuff. And the amazing amount of personnel security stuff that you do, like lockdown of an area because something bad's going on. 
Can you talk a little bit about that? Because you, you gave us a very wonderful, somewhat generic overview of all this, but you want to talk a little bit more about that kind of stuff? Right, so physical access control, physical access control is only one aspect of the electronic security, right? And, and you mentioned this, you have intrusion detection and surveillance, um, and surveillance is, is twofold. And right now, um, you're seeing it be used for intrusion detection, it's also being used for assessment. But these are all typically running on the same system now. And they all have to work together as a whole, as a large, uh, you know, in a large um, uh, unified situation, unified uh, system. Um, trying to focus today simply on the physical access control, but you're absolutely right. It, it has to all work together. And when you identify your stakeholders, look at who's responsible for what happens inside the space. That's the person you ask. You know, don't go ask me what happens on that behind that other door. I don't know. Make sure you find the right people. Somebody's in charge of each and every space in a facility and talk to those people and know what they do in there and know what's critical to that. Is that, a, that address it? So along that same line, um, ISC and their role. While we know that the ISC has a role looking at the, the box, if you will, the external aspect of our facilities, is there an opportunity here, in your opinion, for the ISC to take a more prominent role in the inside the box as well? And if so, and if so, is there an opportunity here for the government and industry to, to bring that suggestion to, to root? and make it a conversation that must be answered? Yeah, I, I think the answer to both questions is, is a resounding yes. Um, I don't think there's any need for the ISC to necessarily reinvent the wheel. Uh, there's a lot of industry best practices and studies and, and work done in these areas. What I think the challenge there is and where the, where the collaboration comes in is how you take these best practices that are defined more generically and put them into a government setting and, and make the policy uh, development to support those work together. And I think that's where that collaboration comes in. Okay. All right, going to our virtual questions from Sal DiAgostino, mm -hmm. who some of us may know. Uh, his question is, would you say PACs and security systems are high risk from a sensitive information perspective or a private privacy perspective it I don't think there's a I don't think there's a yes or no answer to that because I depending on what the size and scope of my security system is if I'm protecting relatively low risk assets then that sent that system by itself may not be uh, a high a high risk I'm not gonna have a high risk system protecting low risk assets so I think it ties to the assets you're protecting with that system okay Another question from Mark or from Michael Neese. Should facilities within an organization have control of how PAX equipment is purchased and implemented, or should it be centralized? Thinking about large Fed agencies. Again, I I don't think there's one answer to that. I think this is where you get into your project characterization. Um, there's no one size fits all. In some cases, it's gonna be absolutely appropriate to try to consolidate systems and use larger enterprise systems. In some places, that would actually um, hurt your situation. The ultimate decision for an authorization has always got to be done at the, lo at the local level. That's absolutely got to be done. You cannot do that at, at some higher level. But how you do that as far as enforcing it, the system, I think, varies, again, depending on the size of the and type of the system. That's where that project characterization comes in. Let's have a little more fun. Uh, one of the things that I've seen over and over again, GSA leases a building, okay? And then they put multiple tenants in it. Mm -hmm. But the building security uses older technology to let you into the, through the turnstiles to get to the elevators. And then you get to uh, the, you know, the federally controlled facility. Right. And, you know, things don't interoperate at that level. What can we do to improve that situation? I heard some rumor that GSA was going to uh, try and say, if you lease a building, it's got to be uh, PIV compliant, but I don't believe that. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. But what would you do to improve that whole tenant situation? It depends on the nature of the tenants, 
right? If I'm looking at a solely federally occupied, even though they're different organizations, then I'm, my one approach might be different because I can actually apply a common set of physical security standards, especially if we continue with the uh, development of ISC standards. But if I have a mixed use facility where I have commercial, a mix of commercial and uh, government, then I'm probably going to be stuck just defining my particular boundary, whether it's the suite, the floor, and saying that's as far as I can go. I don't have any protectable space that I can control beyond that uh, unless I can work collaboratively with the landlord, with the uh, facility owner, uh, to come up with a common set of uh, uh, agreements. So, okay. I think this is the last one. I'm... Good morning. Uh, since physical access control utilizes the authentication security, mm -hmm. is there any plan to include PACs to the CDM? Since we cover the authentication in the logical access in CDM, breaking it down to credential and privilege, are we going to put the PACs into CDM? I'm not even sure I have an answer from that from a policy perspective as to whether that would be a, uh, whether that would be a requirement or not. But I, I mean, it, it certainly makes absolute sense, and I would be looking to go, go ahead and try to achieve that goal, but I, can, I can't make the policy from, my, you know, from where I stand. All right. All right. I think that's about it, but I thank you, and I uh, hope you found this valuable, and I'll be around all day if, uh, if you have any other questions that come up.